So they do a 10 to 12 um, kilometer walk every day, which I then go on doing the patrols with them. Um, they do lots of monitoring and surveillance, and so they're all tagged up so that everyone can know where they are, where the rhinos are, and potentially where they've then got the entrance of poachers coming into the park and be able to see how those correlate. And then the main piece, which they also do, is trying to address the social decay. So loads and loads of education in the schools. And from doing this, literally within the first 18 months, they'd almost managed to reduce poaching to zero. And UN made them champions of the earth in 2015. And that meant they were on a high. They were on this huge pedestal. They were doing amazingly well. But 2016 came, and that was essentially when the rhino poaching went through the roof and morale went through the floor. So from that perspective, um, I answered a Facebook advert, <laughs> like you do. I was looking at leaving the army after a full career. And essentially, it said, would anybody be interested in going to train a female anti-poaching unit in South Africa? So my last week in the army was spent on my resettlement with the members where I literally rocked up and everybody seemed to think that I was going to be doing a slideshow and in a nice classroom. And I said, okay, so when do I go into the, to go and stay with them in the bush? And, they look, and you know, actually the organizer was like, what? I said, well, obviously I can't train them in a classroom. They live in the bush, so when do I go out? Which was fantastic because there was a bit of a drawn moment. It was like, uh, tomorrow? And I was like, great. What I didn't see behind was vehicles moving, trying to find a bed, all of this kind of presumption that a white female would therefore need to be treated like a princess. And whereas I just presumed it would be, you know, roll mat out and it'd be fine. So that was quite interesting. So my role was to basically bring the pride back. How did I do that? So, making a bit of a fool of yourself, a few kind of uh, star jumps. Because once you've got into a low place, having a sense of humor about yourself is so important. And getting these girls just to laugh at each other and to laugh about themselves was the starting point. I don't know if any of you guys have come across neurolinguistic programming, but it's essentially one of the pieces you can do with that is being able to anchor. So I helped them anchor really strong, good feelings because what they'd also been having to encounter was lions. And with lions, unfortunately, comes naturally fear and also the lions realized that the ladies were quite quick at running and going up trees, which also made them more curious. So we did lots of mind and mental work <laughs> to try and get them happy to go back out on patrol. And finally, as things like this, and uh, I have a little treat for you at the end, because I think we're going to try and do a little video for the members, is actually to show them their impact. And so being able to give them the bigger picture of why what they do is important, because we've all sat there at our desk or whatever we're doing or going somewhere, and you just feel like you know, you're one human in this huge, huge world. And this actually is a little picture of the um, head of the Nobel Peace um, Museum in Oslo is actually a South African who I was working with at the time on some contract work. So I go out and help the members as a kind of pro bono where I can. And from that perspective, she did a video saying, thank you so much. I'm part of your diaspora. I really appreciate all the work you're doing, and please keep it going. So to see a white South African who is also working within the peace community in a different country turn around and say thank you was a really big deal for these ladies. They also, within their own communities, like we say, they do an amazing piece of trying to raise awareness, galvanize people together, help each other realize the importance of the wildlife, and they're not just a nicety for white Westerners to come and view. And so that's where the other aspect of how I try and help, making sure that when they go... So the ladies spend three weeks out in the bush, so I spend a lot of time out in the bush with them on night patrol, but it's also getting them to enjoy a little. So the picture you can see is of them actually going to the Kruger where we took them into a hide, got them to be able to look at the rhinos, be able to look at the hippos through the night. And what was fascinating was that when they were out of their own natural environment, they were quite worried again. But the other piece is helping them to read and write. Their spoken English is amazing. So, you know, the power of having English as the international language through Africa is for me just phenomenal because it means they can all communicate across their tribes. And, but what they don't always do is be able to translate that ability to communicate into the written and um, uh, written word and also to be able to read. So when they go home for them one week with their children, I described to them how basically in the UK 
everyone reads to their children before they go to sleep. So the, the picture here is essentially um, <laughs> taking them loads of children's books. So I got them to read the children's books first so that by the time they then took them home to their children, they could really enjoy and feel confident. So a lot of this is all about building up their confidence. So I guess from that aspect is that's a very quick canter through of just trying to make people feel super happy of where they're working finding out what makes each one of them scared, how to overcome that fear, fear, false evidence appearing real, what's actually something to be scared of, so helping them through their knowledge, and then making sure that they know that when they're on top of the world, they can genuinely be able to battle anything. And I hope that for all of us here, you'll take away the thought that every one of those books came from somebody in the UK, each piece of their uniform has been donated from the UK, and that each one of us, like has been suggested, can make a difference by taking something with us when we travel and handing a gift. Thank you very much. Come over here, Alice. <laughs> wow, thank you. Alice, uh, now is your opportunity. Should have said this earlier that you get to ask the questions. So all that time, I hope you were thinking about questions because now is your chance to ask. If you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, there's a lady here. And then wait, pray, for the... Um, uh, what's it called? That thing. Microphone. Thank you. Good. <laughs> I've got a small baby. I can't remember the names of things. Um, uh, where is there only one? Are you the only roving mic? You are. OK, we'll come to you next. Uh, Okay, the chap with the microphone, go. Hi, yeah. um, that was a great presentation, by the way. Um, you mentioned that they're unarmed. Um, obviously, the poachers are probably armed. The lions are quite dangerous. How do, they, how do they approach that? So the fantastic part is why don't you go and shoot or stab predominantly a British Bobby on the beat? It's because culturally that would be really, really undesirable. So, whereas when you have an armed policeman come to your door, you probably don't feel so bad if there's going to be somebody with a knife or a weapon behind it, because they'll feel, well, somebody's coming to me and I'm aggressing back. So it's that reflective behaviour. So the prospect of creating a widow or an orphan from killing a poacher is not what the, women, the members want to take back into their community. But the real strength and power of that is that if one of that community, because essentially the poachers have to come through the outer cordon, so to speak, of the local communities where these women come from and that are their homes and their children are, and each one of them, each one of the members looks after approximately 10 people because they're the only people with a steady income. Wow. So that immediate kind of ring of force is really amazing for them because if a poacher shoots or kills one of them, there's going to be a secondary impact socially. And so actually it's much better for the poachers to go to a different place where it's then viable because it's male on male, it's fighter on fighter, etc. This is all very much looking at the subliminal aspects of how to be able to create calm and peace. And a lot of that is through dealing with the actual culture itself and encouraging peaceful, I guess, pushback. So is that partly why it's significant that these are women? Yes, definitely. Because when I went out, basically the... Um, first time I went out was 10 days. And by the end, it was like, OK, so they invited me to come back. They asked me to stay for three years. I said, I can do three months. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of went. So I finished the contract I was on back in the UK. And then, because um, I literally jumped from the army straight into some work, I was very fortunate for that. So I then went out to South Africa and afterwards, and I ended up staying six. But part of that is helping them do the fear factor of, I'm unarmed, everybody tells me how dangerous it is, is actually going, this is your strength, and reminding them. And we literally did a little circle with them in the middle and said, who will be affected if a rhino is killed? Well, you will, but your family then won't get paid. They won't get any money, because if you get fired, because you're not deemed to be effective. Then look at the outer cordon of the thousand children that they help educate. So they essentially, I said, so we'll look at, and then we went the adult picture of internationally, you know, the... the the, the um, profile that I have is phenomenal. So that ability to demonstrate strong, empowered, young, black women, that's why they call the black members, the irony is not lost. Um, you know, the deadly, mo most deadly snake in the world. And from that aspect, yeah, it is, 
they came back and there were no more poaching. <laughs> so in any of the areas that they are in, it's very, very rarely any poaching. There's one area where one land owner won't allow them in. Seven rhinos went in the period I was there because it was just as there's a change in the law. So now, wherever an animal dies, you're responsible for it. And that was just as they were putting up the law that you could then sell the horn. And so <gasps> therefore, wherever a rhino dies, the person who's responsible for it can then sell the horn. So this is never a simple piece. So magically, where is no longer having any mambas, they have seven deaths. And does the owner keep that for his own wealth? Question mark. Is that, you know... Wait, so the law is that currently, or the law has yeah, now changed? That, that, so so the, the killings were in the preparation, so these, there was a real spike in poaching when they were anticipating the change in the law, and then the law changed, so that now you can trade um, rhino horn. But it has to be through... <laughs> Don't worry. It's, probably... it's all right, put it on speakerphone, we can all answer. If he's Chinese... He's busy. If he's Chinese and he wants to link in on how to get some rhino horn, <laughs> then uh, give us a shout. <laughs> Sorry, but that is where the... No, geographical journeys. No, it's very interesting. Yes, you can still come in. <laughs> Tickets on the door. Um, uh, another question from this lady here. Um, I saw a programme... Yes. Uh, I saw a programme on, on the BBC mm -hmm. about... Was it the Black Mambas or was it um, a different group somewhere else in Africa? So there are... Because there is a group that is armed. Yes, in, in um, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe so they have been set up by an ex-Special Forces Australian gentleman. I haven't met them yet. Um, but yes, I guess that's done under a different premise. But the interesting part for them is they are also an awful lot of single mothers. Yeah. And so, you know, the pressure to ensure that they achieve and to provide for their families is really strong. And lots of the members are also single mums. So then, again, you've got the family unit that's really reliant upon them. Is it tricky that they're then three weeks away from their families and yeah. then a week at home? Yeah. I mean, just imagine your entire, ch your entire child's life, if it's a five-year-old, because the mamas are about five years old now, will have been only seeing your mother for one week out of every month. So that's really tough, because it's not like for us in the British military, you go away for six months, nine months, maybe a year. If you come home, and then you have a steady period at home, this is relentless. That is your routine. And then they get a little bit of holiday. So that's why, you know, it's a really big thing to show them how important that work is and to ensure that that existential piece of what they're offering back into the world. Um, so they've actually just been in Australia for International Women's Day with um, Irwin family. Mm. So to try and help encourage more young people into supporting uh, conservation and wildlife. Mm. Yeah. And the ladies who choose to be part of the Black Mambas, they're choosing that because of that kind of existential desire or because there aren't that many other jobs? Um, I think initially probably because there aren't that many other jobs. And as with how many of us have ever signed up for a job where you didn't really know what you were letting yourself in for. <laughs> <laughs> but then is making sure that afterwards they're being skilled, so they're upskilling in their... And that's why I think the education part is so important. So I spend a lot of time trying to encourage them to read more because then they're getting value added. So they're getting something that means... So we also do career development with them. I do financial planning with them so they can work out how to build a home, for example, or how to build some extra benefit into their family's lives to make it worth them going away. Because there's lots and lots of people across the globe, including myself, that you go away to work, earn, and then you come home. But you want to see a demonstrable benefit from that so that's why I try and help them do financial planning and then the bits for their children which is quite fun so I took a tigger for example because I said everything's donated one of the girls that I know from Santa's bless her I went to go and visit and I said oh she got me to go talk to their school and they all gave me books and everything which was amazing and she said oh Alice I've got tigger I've had it since I was a child who <gasps> what do I she goes I've never wanted to give it to anyone but will you take it to the members so if there's a newborn baby when I've been there, I've been really fortunate. So I basically took the Tigger to this mum and said, here you go, and I took a little photo. So it's all about the connections. So I make sure every time there's a donation that the person who's given it where I possibly can gets to see the benefit and that I link them the other way. So they get to see the kids in the UK who've given the donation. They get to see my friend down on the South Coast who made the donation. So you can link the people together. Um, and that mum has come back. She's now, she was the first dog handler for the members. And she loved the dog so much, they actually had to persuade the training organisation to give her the dog. Which I don't know if you know how much it costs to train an anti-poaching dog, but it's about 200,000 euros. 
Yeah, because there's not many dogs that fancy standing next... That's a good gift. Yeah, that's a big gift. Yeah. Because essentially, just imagine asking a dog to stand next to that and not bark. (laughs) (laughs) So, and the Germans are amazing at it. So the Germans also donate a lot because they help train the dogs. So they take the dogs into the zoos so they can then work out which ones are going to be okay around wildlife. I love it. The dogs bring... uh, Germans bring dogs, the the Brits bring tiggers. (laughs) There's room for us all. Bounce. Okay, so um, there's one thing that you wanted us to do. Yes, please. So, in the part of giving back, please would you all say... I'm going to do a little video. So, here we go. Wait, tell them what you want them to do first. I'm just going to do a quick intro. So, members... For the black members, this is a little video for you. This is the amazing audience at the Royal Geographical Society who have just been hearing all about your work. And look at that, it's instantaneous. I didn't even have to ask. (laughs) Everyone waves. And can you all just say, on the count of three, hello, black members. One, two, three. Hello, black (laughs) members. Brilliant. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.